I'll be reading from Romans 8, verses 12 through 27. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was not subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Thank you, Dave and Justin. All of us like to have options, and the gift of choice is generally a a great blessing uh, when we experience it. And I think in this country, uh, we're probably rather spoiled by having our choice of so many different things. Uh, The choices that that were offered are so numerous in our culture that we might come to think of them as entitlements. We might think of them as being rights rather than being the luxuries that that they really are. But we are constantly being faced uh, with choices, presented with with these options. I know which one of those I would take uh, on any given morning. I would take the donut, uh, knowing that I needed the apple. But, you know, you go to research, you go to Walmart to buy groceries, and you're asked paper or plastic. Uh, you go and have a meal, and there are optional sides that come with the entree, and they'll ask you soup or salad. Uh, Coke or Pepsi, maybe uh, those two options. There are a lot more, especially most places that you go these days. Far less frequently these days is the question smoking or non-smoking. Uh, I do sympathize with those who struggle with uh, nicotine addiction, who maybe have a serious, long-standing smoking habit. And I know that, that some of those must feel rather that, that their rights are somehow being trampled on with so many restrictions on where you can and can't smoke. So I sympathize with you in that, but it's so nice to be able to sit down and have a nice meal somewhere and not have to inhale cigarette smoke or to be on an airplane or in the mall or at a sporting event or in a, in a public building. Uh, we don't even allow uh, smoking in the church office anymore. Um, not, not since Scott stopped smoking. Um, and of course I'm kidding because he hasn't. And I'm still kidding. Um, There is no smoking in in the church office, just to let you know. Uh, Those are simple choices that that we're faced with, but 
life presents us with far more elaborate and complex choices. If you've been to the Cheesecake Factory lately, uh, you are presented an encyclopedic menu. Uh, and if you'll notice, these are, verse, these are uh, pages 19. Cheesecake doesn't even show up till page 19 uh, in this menu. And it's, it's a bit overwhelming. Uh, Starbucks, kind of the same thing. You go there, guys like me that just want a cup of black coffee, uh, just think all of this is superfluous and, and not really needed. There was a former employee uh, that stated that the longest legitimate order that could be keyed into the cash register at Starbucks would be a quad long shot grande in a venti cup half calf, double cup, no sleeve, salted caramel mocha latte with two pumps of vanilla, substitute two pumps of white chocolate mocha for mocha, substitute two pumps of hazelnut for toffee nut, half whole milk, half breve, no whipped cream, extra hot, extra foam, extra caramel drizzle, extra salt, add a scoop of vanilla bean powder with light ice, well stirred. Apparently, all of that would be a legitimate order at Starbucks, and I think they would make it for you. This, however, was, was what I liked. Uh, instead of going to Starbucks, I make my coffee at home, yell my name out incorrectly, then light a $5 bill on fire. <laughs> As you might, I, you know, I'm not opposed to meeting you at Starbucks. I've done that with several of you, and uh, I think it's a tall pike place, black, that I get, but uh, the other way is generally generally how I take mine. Options, options everywhere, uh, but not when it comes to God. There's only one God, and you either believe in that one God or you don't. Uh, that's a choice. You either love this God or you don't. That's a decision that you make. We don't get to choose what kind of option package or trim package we want when it comes to God. We're so used to having choices. We're so used to exercising those options, tailor-making things to our liking and our preferences. God's the one who made us in His image. We don't get the opportunity to make Him in our image. And yet, over and over, we try to do that. Um, so if we believe in God, and we do, and if we love God, as I'm confident, then we do, uh, then belief in the Holy Spirit and love of the Holy Spirit is not optional. Uh, it's, it's not a choice. It's not an add-on in our conception of God. So we can't have the attitude. And just to remind you, uh, we're involved in this quarter in the, the sub-theme of renewing our love. And we're starting with the basics. We're stripping it down to the foundations of those greatest commands as Jesus identified them, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so as we think about loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we've already examined uh, our love for God the Father, our love for God the Son, and today our love for God the Spirit. So we can't have the attitude, I believe in the Father and the Son, I just don't feel or see a particular need for the Spirit. Or I'm comforted and strengthened by the idea of God the Father, and I'm given hope and peace by the idea of God the Son being my Savior, but just tell me again, Tim, why I need to be concerned about the Holy Spirit. We only need to be concerned about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God, and we need the Holy Spirit only because God doesn't exist apart from the Holy Spirit. God exists and only exists as Father, Son, and Spirit, the triune God. There is no divine duo option that, that we can select. And so if our faith is in God, if we love God, then we love the Father and we love the Son and we love the Spirit. So as we think about renewing our love for God the Spirit, we may need to take some time to become reacquainted with Him. Uh, those of you who enjoy the study of the book of Acts and, and following the, the missionary excursions of, of Paul and his companions, remember that at the beginning of his third journey, or in the first part of his third journey, it says in Acts 19, 1 and 2, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. 
Then he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. That's a red flag. Turns out they have been taught and baptized by disciples of John the Baptist uh, decades after the life and ministry of John the Baptist. But he builds upon their answer to provide further teaching. So when asked, you know, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Some of us might possibly respond the same way, at least when it comes to our consciousness of the Holy Spirit within the divine nature, our consciousness of the Holy Spirit in our life of discipleship in Jesus Christ. So church, did you receive the Spirit when you believed? Uh, did you receive the Spirit when you were baptized into Jesus Christ? Uh, that's an answer that you have to give. So as we think about loving the Spirit, I think there are all kinds of reasons why. A few weeks ago, I asked you to pray every day, and in your prayers, tell the Father that you loved Him and tell Him why. So Holy Spirit, why would, why would we love you? Well, first of all, I love you, Holy Spirit, because you are God. Familiar story in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira have a piece of property. It's theirs to keep, theirs to do with what they want to. They decide to sell it like others have done. But rather than bring the, the entire proceeds of the sale to the apostles' feet, they deceitfully bring part of it. They don't have to bring any of it. But they bring part of it under the guise that it is the full sale price of, of the property. And... They may be deceiving everyone, but, but not Peter, not, not God. So Peter asked Ananias, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? A little bit later, you haven't lied to man, but to God. To lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to the divine nature. Very beloved psalm to many of us, Psalm 51, verse 11. Don't cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, going through the book of Psalms uh, with the high school class right now on Wednesday nights in May, some selected Psalms. And one part of Hebrew poetry is parallelism. And synonymous parallelism is when you say one thing and then you say it the exact same thing again, but in slightly different language. Uh, different words, same idea. And this is synonymous parallelism. Don't cast me away from your presence. What does that mean? That means to take your Holy Spirit from me. To have the Spirit, uh, the presence of the Spirit, is to have the presence of God. Similarly, in Psalm 139, sorry, I'm several clicks away here. There we go. Apologies for that. Psalm 139, verse 7, similar thought. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence, God? In Hebrews 9, 14, the spirit is referred to as the eternal spirit. There's only one eternal being. There's only one God who is, who was, and who is to come. And so to refer to the spirit as the eternal spirit there's only one ID that the, the Spirit can have, and that is divine DNA, a divine uh, ID. I love you, Holy Spirit, because you empowered Jesus to fulfill his ministry. Uh, in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8, we read how the Son, the eternal Word, even though he existed as God, did not regard that equality with God, existence as God, something to be grasped or to held on to at all costs, but he willingly let go of that, divested himself, not of his deity, but of his glory and power. So when he is born uh, to Mary... He is as helpless an infant as any infant that has ever been born. He was still Emmanuel. He was still God in the flesh, but voluntarily handed over his divine glory and his power. So there's no miracles performed by Jesus while he's growing up. He had a typical childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood. The only thing we know about that is that one account that Luke tells us when he was 12 years old and made that annual pil pilgrimage with his family to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Uh, so unlike the fanciful, uninspired, 
infancy gospels, as they're sometimes called, that were manufactured uh, by people in the second century that had all kinds of crazy stories about things that Jesus did in his childhood. This is material worthy of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, what you read in those infancy gospels. But Jesus doesn't have that power to exercise in his childhood, his adolescence, or his young adulthood, not until he is divinely empowered by the anointing of the Spirit, the descent of the Spirit upon him at his baptism. So after his baptism, after the 40 days in the desert with the devil, and after he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth, he goes to the synagogue as was his custom. The scroll of Isaiah is handed to him. He reads from Isaiah chapter 61, which is recorded in Luke 4, 8 to 19. And he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me. God has anointed me with His Spirit to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is empowered to do what He does through the, the Spirit who descends upon Him. So when critics, when unbelievers among the Jewish leadership can't believe that, that he is casting out demons, they, they can't deny that, so they try to attribute the power uh, to cast out demons to the ruler of the demons, the prince of the demons, Beelzebub. And Jesus says that, that makes no sense at all. A house divided against itself, a city divided against itself can't stand. Why would Satan cast out Satan? But then he says in verse 28 of Matthew 12, if it's by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And Jesus is saying that's exactly what you're seeing. That's exactly what you're experiencing. The king, kingdom of God has come upon you because I cast out these demons by a greater spirit. The Spirit of God. I love you, Holy Spirit, because through you, by you, and in your name, I was baptized. Baptism is a work of God through the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus talked to Nicodemus about this in John chapter 3, in verse 3, he calls it being born again. In verse 5, he defines being born again as being born of water and the Spirit. Nothing else but baptism that this could be referring to. He says, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and born of the Spirit. When he gives those, uh, parting, uh, that parting charge and those uh, parting words to the apostles before he ascends back to the Father, he tells them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We were baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Our baptism doesn't exist apart from the Spirit. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, we were all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body. And that doesn't make any difference whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you were a slave or a free person, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Titus 3, 5, God saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us, and notice how he describes our baptism here. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, born of the water, born of the spirit, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So baptism into Christ doesn't exist and doesn't happen apart from the Holy Spirit and His work. As Jesus says plainly in John chapter 6, verse 63, it's the Spirit who gives life. What kind of life? Spiritual life, bringing us out of spiritual darkness, bringing us out of spiritual death. Same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Holy Spirit, I love you because my body is a sanctuary for the gift of your abiding presence. As Jesus taught in Matthew chapter, uh, excuse me, John chapter 7, John writes that 
Uh, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Lord, what do you mean by that? He continues, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow uh, from within them. I appreciate the additional explanation, but what does that mean? That from within us are going to flow these rivers of living water. This is when John, in his writing of the gospel, explains it for us and says, By this Jesus meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So the requisite, the requirement for receiving the Spirit who was to come, as expressed in this verse, is belief or faith. Added to that in Acts 2.38, based on that faith, is repentance and baptism. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. The, these streams of living water that are going to flow from within you, the Spirit who is to be given based on your faith in Jesus Christ, you will receive Him when you turn from your sins and when you are baptized. Acts 5.32, summing all that up in a statement of obedience. We are witnesses of these things, Peter says, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. How many of those who obey him? All of those who obey him. The Spirit has been given. Not just in some metaphorical sense or theoretical sense, but in a real bodily sense within us. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, don't you know that your bodies, each and every one of you who is a baptized believer, do you not know that your bodies are sanctuaries or temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your bodies because they don't belong to you. They exist for the glory of God. Romans 8, 9, you, however, as baptized believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, you're not in the realm of the flesh anymore, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. If anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ... They don't belong to Christ. How can you tell who belongs to Christ? They are those who have the Spirit of Christ. Holy Spirit, I love you because you're the seal of my Christian identity and the down payment of my eternal inheritance. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22. I know we're, we're covering a lot of scripture this morning. I meant to say at the outset that if, if you don't like a lot of, a lot of scripture and sermons, you're going to hate this one. Um, but just to encourage you, we're about 75% of the way through it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now it's God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. How did he anoint us? With, with whom did he anoint us? He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Uh, in the ancient world, short of ID cards... And business cards, you would take some, some hot wax, you would place it over whatever you wanted to identify, and you would bury your signet ring or a signet seal into that wax, leaving your mark, saying, this belongs to Gerald Burrow. This is his. It's authentic. It's validated. Uh, it is guaranteed to be from Gerald. God giving his spirit to his children identifies us as his children and is the first installment, the first payment, the down payment, uh, the earnest money of our inheritance. Same thing in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. What seal? The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I love you, Holy Spirit, because you are my helper, my comforter, my counselor, and my advocate. And we get this, first of all, in, in Jesus' extended discourse in John 14, 15, and 16, when he repeatedly talks about the coming Spirit and what the Spirit would do. 
Here in verses 16 and 17 of John 14, I'll ask the Father. He will give you another advocate. I'm one. I'm a helper. I'm a comforter. I'm a counselor. I'm, I'm an advocate. But he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Who's that? Jesus. It's the spirit of truth. The world can't accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. And, and this word that, that's highlighted there, uh, in the King James Version, it was comforter. Translated as comforter. Uh, in the New American Standard Bible, it's helper. In your old, new, international version, it was counselor. In your new, new, international version, it's advocate. Uh, it's because all of that is balled up in this one word, and, and the word there is parakletos. Now, when I mentioned that a few weeks ago, some of you heard me say broccoli toast. Um, <laughs> Jesus did not talk about the broccoli toast. Uh, avocado toast, while I'm on toast, um, one of my favorites, just ripe avocado, a little salt and pepper, maybe some grated Parmesan cheese, uh, great breakfast, lunch, dinner, late night snack. Uh, but we're not talking about those. We're talking about parakli toast, not broccoli toast. Um, para, meaning alongside, uh, the second part of the word from kaleo that means to call. Someone who is called alongside. Someone who is called alongside for the purpose of aid, assistance, help, support, strength. Those things that all of us need. So Jesus, in what way is the spirit of truth going to be my parakletos, my helper, my advocate? Well, he will provide moral courage and emotional strength. Ephesians 3.16, those things that arise from within us. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. How? With power from where? Through his spirit in your inner being. That strength for the moral courage that we need to live this life, that emotional strength that we need to face the trials and the difficulties that we experience. Also, by his help, that we overcome sin and put to death the works of the flesh. Dave read that for us from Romans 8, verse 13. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. That's a guarantee. Again, there's no option here. If you live according to the flesh, this is where that leads. But... If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Uh, don't try this on your own. Don't try this at home without any assistance because you will fail. It is only by the Spirit that we're able to put to death the misdeeds of the body. As Dave also read, the Spirit helps us in our prayers. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness we don't know what we ought to pray for. We don't know how we should pray. Some translations render it. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us, prays on our behalf, speaks to the Father for us with groanings too deep for words, with wordless groans. Every time we pray, the Spirit prays with us and the Spirit prays for us making sure that the Father knows exactly what is in our heart. The Spirit knows our heart. The Father knows the heart of the Spirit. Therefore, we have the confidence that even though we can't find the words, uh, don't even know if the words exist to express what we want to say to God in prayer, we have full confidence that that is communicated with 100% perfect clarity and accuracy by the Spirit who intercedes for us. Um, it's the spirit who bears moral and ethical fruit of Christian character in our lives. Evidence of the spirit, fruit of the spirit, a sign that the spirit is in you and that you are living by the spirit, keeping in step with the spirit. Then you'll have love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Those things against which there is no law. So we've been crucified, uh, we've crucified the flesh along with its passions and desires, so now we live by the Spirit. So let's keep in step with the Spirit, and if we do that, those evidences will be apparent. 
Summing up all of this, especially in regard to the promise of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would come to be our helper, our advocate, our counselor, our comforter, the one called alongside to give us aid, that keeps us from being self-deceived kindergartner Christians uh, who naively and mistakenly, mistakenly believe, like a lot of kindergartners, when it comes to anything, I can do it by myself. You know when they get to that age? You know, they've been kind of content for you to help them with whatever, you know, putting on their shoes, putting on their clothes, cutting their meat. I can do it by myself. They get to that point. Uh, we never get to that point in our relationship with God. We can't have that attitude because we can't do it by ourselves. All we managed to do by ourselves was sin. And we did that perpetually, we did that habitually, we lived, did that hopelessly until something changed. And the something that changed was we surrendered self to God and let Him take control. And through His power and His strength, that's why we've been able to live the lives that we've been able to live for the last year or five years or 10 years or 20 years or 40 years or 50 years. All this time we thought it was us. All this time, we thought we were doing it by ourselves. We can't do anything spiritually by ourselves. Righteousness is credited to us through our faith in the working of God and only accomplished through the power of God's Spirit. Jesus had harsh judgmental words for those who attributed the Spirit's power to Satan's power. And I can't imagine that he's any less displeased when we attribute the Spirit's power to our own power as if we have done these things, if we, as if we could accomplish anything without His help and His power. Whatever we accomplish for God, we accomplish through the strength of His Spirit who lives in us. So if you've ever felt like something was missing in your Christian life, maybe the, the something that's missing is not a something at all, but a someone who has been missing in your life. Someone who dwells within us, uh, but whose presence we may not often consciously acknowledge, someone upon whom we may not heavily lean because for some reason we think of the Father, we think of the Son, and don't think of the Spirit. Uh, Spirit, we love you. We worship and adore you just as we love and worship and adore the Father and the Son. Spirit can't work at all in your life. Spirit can't exist in your life until you surrender through faith and obedience. Until in faith you turn from sin. Until because of faith you confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Until you are united with Him and receive that indwelling presence as a gift of God. If you want to do that this morning, we're ready. Uh, we would love nothing more than to spend the the next 10 to 15 minutes celebrating your, your rebirth into Jesus Christ, born of the water, born of the Spirit. Any other need that you may have, please make that known as well while we're standing and singing this song together.